In this video, we'll change out an axle seal on a Dodge Ram. We'll do an external exam on a broken track lock limited slip differential. We'll study ring gear contact patterns and we'll adjust ring gear backlash. Oh crap, look at this. That dark staining around the hub is almost certainly from a slowly leaking axle seal. You wanna fix this right away so you don't get oil contamination of brake shoes. Eight years ago, I did a video of how to replace the left axle seal on this very truck. In retrospect, it might have been wise to replace the right side at the same time. All right, let's have a look here. Oh yeah. To change out that seal, I need to remove the hub. So I need to release the axle retaining C-clips inside the diff. This time I'm going to take the opportunity to examine the limited slip differential in more detail. Here's the tag on the diff. I've often wondered if the limited slip differential in this truck is working properly. I've got no interest in burnouts, but at times in snow we seem to lose traction with one spinning rear wheel. Even though I've added friction modifier every time I've changed the fluid, this truck just doesn't seem to have the traction I'd expect from a limited slip differential. This shot clearly shows we've got a stock Chrysler track lock limited slip differential. The yellow arrow points at one of the two clutch plaques with alternating clutch plates and washers. I'm flicking one of the retaining clips with a screwdriver. The retaining clips in this design are prone to breaking, though this one looks fine. Now let's roll the case around to the other side. Oh crap, look at this. That's a crack. I think the washer we're looking at is a special one called a Belleville Spring, which is a cone-shaped washer used to provide smooth axial preload compression of the clutch pack. When the side gear is torqued, it pushes the washer outward to squeeze the plates inside the clutch pack together. Now let's look at the right side. Not only do we have a crack, we've got a gap of missing steel. Let's spin the housing 180 degrees. Oh my gosh, we've got an inch of washer missing. You can see underlying washers and clutch plates underneath. I can't th find that missing fragment anywhere. Let's establish a baseline. Here I'm measuring ring gear backlash, which should measure between five and eight thousandths of an inch. You can see we're way over. This reads more than 20 thousandths. I don't think the broken washers caused that. Now for fun, let's paint a baseline contact pattern. After applying paint, I'll get a friend to turn the drive shaft while I hold the ring gear back, offering as much resistance as we can to properly smoosh the paint for a clear pattern. Here's what it looks like. We're on the concave side, which is always the coast side. The thing that jumps out at me is how the pattern extends right to the edge, what they call the face of the tooth. It's too far out. That should improve as I move the ring gear closer. Also notice the pattern is closer to the heel than the toe. Here's the drive side. It's a nice pattern in the middle, but it's also a little closer to the heel than the toe. When I reduce backlash, I expect both the drive and the coast patterns to move towards the toe. Before we start, let's visualize what we're doing. Ring gear backlash evaluates how tightly the ring gear, number one, meets up with the pinion gear, number four. Our backlash is too big, so we need to slide our ring gear assembly over to the right side so it mates against the pinion gear a little more tightly. Traditionally, that was done with shims, and you take a shim from the right side and move it over to the left. In this diff, we've got threaded adjusters, but remember the principle is the same. Once you've got it in place, the adjusters need to be clamping the diff tightly between them to prevent the housing from shifting from side to side. Now let's get the axles out. First I remove the shaft lock screw, which requires a drop of Loctite when you reassemble. Then I'll lightly tap out the pinion mate shaft with a brass punch. Then I'll push both axles inward to expose the C-clips inside the diff. Then I'll use a magnet on a stick to remove the two C-clips. Then pull both axles out, wipe them down and clean and inspect the bearing surfaces and the bearings. Now I'm removing the axle seal. Usually these just pop out with a seal puller or a screwdriver prying from the inside, but this one was surprisingly tight. Evidently the last guy to replace that seal used RTV on the outer surface. With a screwdriver and a hammer I eventually got it loose. I left the new seal off until just before putting everything back together. Just remember that whenever you're replacing a seal, you should have a look at the vent tube. This is it here. It comes off uh, this connector right here, which serves a double purpose to hold the brakes. Just make sure it's not kinked or plugged off. I blew into this end and, and it's fine. Now let's have a look at the threaded adjusters deep inside the axle tubes. 
They look like wheels with holes and spokes on the outside and an internal hexagonal hole on the inside. Here's one listed for sale on Rock Auto. Both sides have right-hand threads, and you can access them either with a male hex that's 36 millimeters across the flats, or by pushing a screwdriver into holes, shown here. Now there's a special tool for adjusting backlash, and basically it's a long pole with a uh, hex on the end that's 36 millimeters across the flats here. And so I've decided to make this myself. I've taken an old socket, and I've jammed it into an, what works out to an M24 nut, and then now I'll just weld it on the back side. And um, a half inch extension will fit right into this, so that should work perfect. I've taped this to a half inch long extension that any mechanic will have just so it doesn't uh, come off down that deep hole. Use a three quarter. Of course, to allow the adjusting screws to push a differential to the right side, we need to loosen the four cap bolts that hold the diff in place, and we need to loosen the locking tabs on both sides. This is a problem because when you loosen these cap bolts, the diff shifts back and then your backlash will instantly increase. So before taking any repeat measurements, you need to retighten. The torque spec on those axle cap bolts is 100 foot-pounds. Now let's think about this. If I start by trying to screw in the left adjuster, I won't be able to turn it very far because the right adjuster won't allow the diff to move to the right. So first we need to give the diff a place to move by turning the right side a quarter turn out. Then I need to turn the left a quarter turn in to shift the diff over, so we'll do that now. When you think you're close, you retighten the cap bolts, measure your backlash again, and then try again. This can take several attempts. At the end, the torque spec on both adjusting screws is 75 foot-pounds, done with cap bolts loose, and then you finally torque the cap bolts down and double check your numbers. Here are the gear patterns after bringing the backlash into spec. I'm not entirely happy with the pattern on the coast side. As predicted, the imprint has nicely moved away from the edge of the tooth, but now it's a little too close to the toe. Secondly, there's more variance than I'd like to see between the teeth. The drive side looks a little better. It's nicely centered, if anything a little closer to heel than toe. These patterns might be better with a thicker shim under the pinion gear to move the pinion in a little closer. However, with more work to do on broken clutch plates, I'm going to leave the pinion gear alone for now. So at this point, a lot of guys would replace the LS differential to something a little bit more reliable. Or you could just leave it, recognizing that the chance that the differential will grenade is pretty small. After a little bit of thought, I've decided to go back to the original clutch packs. I've got some new clutch packs on order, and I hope to take you along with what will effectively be a part two. Thanks for watching.